A parade in Montreal is also sparking controversy. The city's Fête Nationale celebration yesterday was supposed to showcase Quebec culture, but now it's drawing criticism about diversity and inclusivity. Kate McKenna picks up the story. The video is striking. Non-white teenage boys pushing a float carrying a white Quebec singer while scores of people dressed in white walk behind. Félix Broyer shot the video and posted it on Facebook. It's now had more than a million views. I know it's a coincidence. It just feels like a, a series of seemingly unrelated bad decisions that culminated in that perfect picture of like something terrible. Organizers say the whole thing was a misunderstanding and that the boys pushing the float were actually volunteers from this Montreal school. The idea was to be eco-friendly, no motorized floats. We're sorry if people are shocked, this organizer says, but this year, more than ever, he says the Fête Nationale parade celebrated diversity. Emily Nicolas says her stomach sank when she saw the float yesterday. It was very disconcerting, it was very uncomfortable, um, and it was actually hurting. Nicolas shot this video of another float where black participants are seen pushing white people. I've seen people all over social media who are born here or are racialized who were writing, this is why even though I'm born here, I've never felt like I'm a Quebecer. On nous a demandé de participer, ça nous a fait plaisir. But the coach of the boys who pushed the first float says they were asked to participate and were happy to. He also says it's disappointing that people saw the color of their skin and not that four young men volunteered their time for the parade. This isn't the first time organizations in the city have faced similar criticisms. At the end of last year, an ad was released celebrating the city's 375th anniversary. It featured only white people, prompting an outcry. The creator pulled it and promised to remake it. Felix Boyer says if his video opens a discussion, then it's a good thing. Kate McKenna, CBC News, Montreal. Donald Trump made the animosity even sharper. The establishment and their media and neighbors will control over this nation. Anyone who challenges their control is deemed a sexist, a racist, a xenophobe, and morally deformed. Quite the year. Joining me now are panelists. Supriya Devetti is a talk radio host in Toronto. Lincoln Anthony Blades is a columnist with Teen Vogue, writing about race, culture and politics. And Tasha Carradine is a talk radio host and columnist with iPolitics. So it was a pretty interesting year if you're a journalist <laughs> or a pundit or a columnist, but a uh, little rough for the world. <laughs> anyway, I'm going to start with you, Supriya. I mean, what, what drove all of the division this year, do you think? So I think a big part of it is the fact that for a very long time there was a homogeneous sort of ruling class that was never used to having any of their positions challenged either publicly or privately. And now with the advent of some equalizers like social media, you now are hearing from a number of voices that we never really used to include in sort of the mainstream debate. And I think that's what you're seeing a lot of pushback. I also think there's an aspect to this, both on the left and the right, in which you need to be ideologically pure. So it's not just enough to want to reform Obama Obamacare, let's say, and to improve coverage, but you have to dismantle it altogether and go with single payer. And I'm not saying that's necessarily bad, but ultimately, when you can never have any sort of nuance, I, I think that leads to greater divisions, even amongst people that would normally say that they're on the same side of a, of a debate. What do you think, Tash? Is it all reaction to change, political change, or is some of it economic too? Well, I think division follows disruption. And I think I, I agree with a lot of what you just said, Sapria, because I think there's, um, there's a piece of it around people wanting to make their voice heard, people who also you've seen a lot of immigration changing the nature of who is in our society. And they feel new people feel excluded. Many people say, people of First Nations, for example, say they have not been included in the conversation. And because we have institutions also that allow people to express their voice, whether it's human rights tribunals or social media or other places, they're able to do so. Technology and technological disruption is the other big thing I would say, and I'm not just talking about the internet, but robotics and the changing nature of the workplace. And a lot of what fueled Donald Trump and his rise, I think, is the sense that the heartland economically of the United States has been gutted. And a lot of the people who are being told, as in white people, is like, you have privilege, are saying, wait a minute, we actually don't. We've lost our jobs and no one speaks for us. And Donald Trump, unfortunately, 
does speak for us. And as a result, you're seeing this pushback that you alluded to. People say we feel that we are being unfairly attacked in some ways. So much there. <laughs> <laughs> Start with what, what's your basic take, Lincoln? Um, the way I've been looking at the racial division that we've been seeing, um, I don't know if I would necessarily ascribe it to being economic. Um, I don't think it's about economic anxiety. I think that socially we've regressed. And what we've regressed to is that arguments that we once said we're completely okay with, we're now sort of relitigating. And uh, we're relitigating subject. people, we're, relit we're relitigating uh, Muslim rights. Are you a citizen or not? Do you deserve human rights? Do you, civil rights in the United States of America, the Civil Rights Act that Martin Luther King passed, or that helped, he helped inspire to get passed, uh, the Housing Rights Act, those are now being repealed by Jeff Sessions. So the idea that we're equal citizens who deserve equal rights and equal housing, that's being literally stripped away. And the problem is, is that instead of talking about these things in a qualitative manner, we're talking about how a lot of white people feel when they get mean tweets aimed at them for their comments that they make on social media that are insensitive. It really feels like we're living in two different countries. Well, I would say actually that a lot of what you're saying, I don't disagree with, but I think the piece around Islam and that is a more, um, I guess, a phenomenon that has a lot to do also with events that have taken place where people will unfairly ascribe to all Muslims, for example, uh, terrorist connotations or other things. And that is a reaction that we've seen since 9-11. I mean, it is not something uh, that was, you know, just created out of thin air. Unfortunately, there is a reality that there is Islamic extremism, but people will ascribe it to a larger group. And but they also have a place to speak it, and that goes to the, the, the um, I guess, the, the forums we have where people will say things and spout off in a very vitriolic way. So when we're talking about the, uh, uh, the divisions that we have and how deep they go, we can talk about Muslim extremism, that's fine, but then when do we talk about like white male extremism? When do we talk about domestic terrorism that's been driven by white males who are ideologically against inclusion? Like the problem that we have is that when you talk about these deep divisions, there's one side that's being heard and they get to say everything that they want and then claim that they're actually being repressed in thought. And then there's another side that's actually falling victim, physically falling victim to the other side's But we, ha we have talked about violence um, by the police in particular against the black community. If you're talking about specific instances, there are of course a lot of racial instances and discrimination that do not make the headlines. But at the same time, there are some that have. And that again, that's the flip side to forums where you can speak out and Twitter and other places where people do bring that to light and bring that conversation out. But it's, it's not a pretty conversation. Well, but you were talking, go ahead, Sabrina. I, I was just going to say, but I, I think a lot of the time our debates are, they're false equivalencies. Like, the, yeah. it's, it's one thing to say that you have your, you feel like you're self-censuring, let's say, on a social media platform mm -hmm. because you're afraid of, of people calling you out. But there's another thing, if you're actually being, you know, brutalized by police violence or if your rights are being stripped away like there's it's it's not the same like you, you, you get what I mean because I, I, mean, I, I self censor just... all the time too I, I I don't consider myself you know a victim of uh, of, of the Twitter mob or whatever mm. you want to call it well, there's a balance too to self to censorship and self censorship because I think a lot of people say things they feel in the cloak of anonymity they can say all sorts of things they wouldn't say to someone's face which in that self censorship I actually would rather see more of yeah. more thoughtful <laughs> conversation but it's hard when people are driven by emotion too. So there's so much. All of this is being played out and not everybody is on Twitter or Instagram or mm -hmm. online even. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, but, but more is being expressed. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? I mean generally, is, is it good that people are having these debates or are we heading down a very dangerous path? I think the nature of the debates is heading us down to a very dangerous path. So when you look at it, for example, the way that, and we, we can talk about media responsibility also. So when you look at it, um, young black man gets shot by the police and then you bring on an ex-former cop and then you bring on like a Black Lives Matter activist. You sit them at the table and the general discussion is like, is it bad that this unarmed person got executed? As opposed to saying, okay, what can we do in our society to actually fix it to a point where this sort of stuff doesn't happen? Mm -hmm. The nature of the discussion is incivil. What do you think, Supriya? Is it getting better or worse overall? Like, the, is this division, these debates, as fractious as they may be, are they leading towards something positive? So I agree with Lincoln in terms of the debate themselves. They can sometimes be, you know, that, that's a bad thing. That in fact that we're debating people's humanity and debating people's civil rights when it comes to equal protection under the law. But I think ultimately, when you're talking about the kinds of change these sorts of debates have sprung forward, like the advent of and just how great Black Lives Matter has been, not just in Toronto, but, you know, across North America with getting these rights heard and getting people to notice the fact that we're having open discussions about rape culture, even though, you know, there was just a 
mistrial with Cosby, but we're all sort of talking about it in a more open forum. I think that's ultimately good. But I think but if you're a minority, then at this point in 2017, like you don't want the discussion. No, of course not. You want the yeah. results. Yeah. No, but you, and, but you have to have the discussion too in but, a way that doesn't if, exclude. If I just, because you mentioned Black Lives Matter, I just want yeah. to jump in for one moment okay. because the whole yeah. conversation around the Pride uh, Parade in Toronto, for example, and the exclusion of police in uniform from that okay. has in, in, very negatively impacted a lot of people's opinions of Black Lives Matter and the way they went about it. And I, this would, is I, I would, oh, and yeah. So no, would, the, but the only thing I would say with that, and I don't disagree because, you know, our inboxes, oh, oh, I'm sure, are very are, similar are, when, we, yes. when we talk about this sort of stuff on the radio, but ultimately I would say that I don't know if those people were ever really for Black Lives Matter or but, for but, but can we just uh, The point I want to make here is that Black Lives Matter wasn't born out of an idea that came, that sprung off by watching a movie. Right. Black Lives <laughs> Matter was sprung off of the idea that black lives did not matter. Mm -hmm. It did not matter statistically in the amount of times that we've been victims of states Sponsor violence, and it doesn't matter in the way that we've been treated. But do you think that the movement is gathering the fans movement, or people or greater understanding? But this is the thing, and and I don't in think they order need fans. to care, yeah, I was going to say, in order to care but about, I, but to Tasha's exactly. argument that it's alienating people, is, is, but, does but that I, accomplish the, the goal? People, so black people in our society in Canada, where we try to be a very inclusive community, black people are victims of systemic racism. The indigenous people are victims of systemic racism. So when a group comes along and they start advocating for change, but when they, this idea, this, I was going to say, mm -hmm. this, this, uh, this idea that like they're not winning over fans, it's that there's people who weren't on the side of caring about our no, issues you, in the first when place. When you call Justin Trudeau a white supremacist terrorist, as the leader of Black Lives Matter did, you alienate people who say, I could be on board with some of what you're saying and I recognize the roots of it, but this is not, this is too far, and this, this goes to this, this culture that we're talking about where people say things that are divisive. Got to wrap up yeah. in just a moment, but I just want to get a sense. It's been a rough year on all these fronts <laughs> around the world. What is your sense generally for this year coming? Do you see things getting more fractious, each of you, or, or do you see things, people starting to listen to each other? Um, I think I do see things continuing to be fractious. And I go back to just one quick point, which is that I do think economics does drive a lot of this and the sense that people, it's not simply violence against groups, but the sense that they are excluded from the economic mainstream and success of other groups that is being challenged. And that upheaval is a longer term process to yeah. resolve. So things may in fact get more you know, heated in terms of our divisions, but I think ultimately as long as goals keep being met, I think it's good. If you look at the way that Black Lives Matter has pushed the conversation forward and actually gotten policy changes done, I think it's good. And just to go back to the, to the divisiveness, you know, back in the 60s, it's not like people were lining up to support Martin Luther King or um, Malcolm X in, in, in any way. So this is always sort of existed. I think whether you think that we live in a poor town or whether you think we live in a big rich town, uh, at the end of the day, uh, it seems to be minorities who are getting the shorter end of the stick. And until we start talking about those issues and not how they make people feel, but actually how they're actually being treated. But your prediction, better or worse this year? It's going to get worse, but depending on how the, 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 dominant, the silent majority, it's, on, it's, on, it's up to them. Thanks so much. It's been uh, quite a season. Thank you. Thank you. Yes.